In this tutorial, I will explain how to understand the chemical machine programming as a development upon the actor model. This uh, is something I recently uh, realized and wrote up as one of the chapters in the documentation book for the chemist project. Many developers are familiar with the actor model. Uh, in Scala, usually one has the ACA library uh, to implement the actor model. Now, um, assuming that you already understand the actor model and how to use it, I will now describe the chemical machine as an actor model with some changes uh, and improvements. What is the actor model? Uh, in brief, uh, it has lightweight processes called actors that can have state. Uh, they receive messages and they can also send messages to other actors. When an actor receives a message, what happens, we can write as this pseudocode. There is the receive construction and x is the value of the message or, or value carried by the message and once the actor receives the message then uh, some process starts or some thread wakes up or whatever but we don't need to worry about those details in the actor model we just describe what should happen when the message is received and what should happen is usually there is some computation or side effect uh, that may send messages to other actors or perform other side effects. Uh, for example, read or write the database and so on. Um, also, we may update the state of the actor. So S in this pseudocode stands for the state, the value that the actor holds inside. So there's a state and the previous state is s and this side effect might depend on the previous state and also the new state is computed as again it could depend on the value received in the message and on the previous state and then the new state is stored as s so when the new message arrives it will be a new s and and this computation will continue and so on. So that's how the actor model works. Now, um, a chemical machine is very similar in many ways to the actor model. Uh, it also runs lightweight processes uh, which are very similar to actors. So I might temporarily call them chemical actors um, although in the chemical metaphor they're called reactions. Uh, they're not threads, just like actors are not threads. They are implemented on top of threads uh, as lightweight processes. So, um, however, the chemical machine is different from the actor model in two important ways. One, uh, in the actor model, the programmer is responsible for creating actors and managing them. Uh, for instance, initializing the state and when an actor um, dies or crashes for whatever reason, then we might have to reinitialize it or uh, restore the state and so on. Uh, in the chemical machine, the chemical actors are created automatically. So they are completely managed by the runtime. The programmer does not write code to manage them. Um, the programmer does not have access to specific instances of chemical actors. So that all of that is completely automatically managed by the runtime system. So that's the first and most important difference. Um, another uh, detail is that in a chemical machine, 
messages are strongly typed. They're statically typed uh, so that for each specific sort of actor, uh, the type of value x is fixed. Uh, in the ACA library, this is not so, but there is an ACA typed library which is adding this feature so that you have uh, statically fixed and checked types so that you cannot send the message to an actor with the value of the room type. In the chemical machine, this is uh, already done as well. So, so all the chemical actors have uh, statically defined and checked types for their message values. Um, however, the automatic management of actor instances is uh, a very significant departure from the actor model. Um, the second departure is that chemical actors may wait for several different messages uh, that need to be sent to different mailboxes. Um, so when you think about a usual actor, then the messages arrive at the mailbox and then the actor picks them up one by one from the mailbox. And you can think about this as um, the system waiting for a message from a single mailbox. Now chemical actors may wait for messages from several different mailboxes at once and a chemical actor will not start until all of these mailboxes have at least a message and one message in them and then uh, the ordinary actor consumes one message at a time from a single mailbox chemical actor can consume several messages at a time from several different mailboxes at once atomically so either it consumes all of them or it consumes none of them so these are the two ways in which the actor model is modified and um, the content of this tutorial is to show that uh, these requirements, first of all, the second requirement in some sense follows from the first one um, and also to show that all the features of the chemical machine, all the, um, the way that it's written and defined logically follows from these requirements. So once we wish that actors were automatically managed by the system, everything else follows. We must depart from the actor model and arrive at the chemical machine. And so in this tutorial now I will show why that is so. And um, in this way it will become clear that the chemical machine is a an extension or a development upon the actor model that frees the programmer from the tasks of managing actor instances. And also it has um, other features that logically follow from that requirement. So consider what happens if we require that uh, actor instances must be automatically managed. Uh, so, whenever uh, a message arrives, let's write it in this uh, different syntax, which is now closer to, closer to actual uh, chemical machine syntax in the chemist library, but otherwise very similar to this. I'm just not going to write receive, instead I'm going to write uh, go. And, um, that's so far the only change and also I'm going to ask so what must I have in order to be able to instantiate actors automatically so when the message comes I have not created an instance of an actor I just defined uh, this this function and uh, the system must create an actor automatically. It is clear that this actor cannot have any mutable state inside because the system will create this actor from scratch every time that a message is received. 
And so if this actor has some state, it's going to be the same state every time. So it will be a constant state. It will not be a mutable state anymore. Therefore, the uh, chemical actors must be stateless. So that's the first and very important consequence of the requirement that chemical actors are automatically managed. Um, the, the user code now does not create instances of actors, it merely declares the computation that the actors must carry out. And this computation becomes just a function of the input message value. So this input message value that we receive, or we could still say this is receiving, but somehow I have to label this so that I know where to send the values. So um, essentially the mailbox still needs to be uh, defined as a value in the code, but it's the mailbox. It's not an instance of an actor. It's not a particular instance with a particular state or anything like that. It's a mailbox and whenever some messages arrive to that mailbox, we can still use the syntax from the ACA library. Whenever a message arrives, the system will automatically create an actor with this body and get uh, f of x to be computed. Now f of x will still can contain side effects and send messages to other, other mailboxes but that's it. So we don't have the state S as we had here in this pseudocode. Um, I'm writing pseudocode rather than actual ACA code because ACA is very verbose. It has a lot of boilerplate about creating instances, properties, actor references, and so on. I don't need that. I just want to indicate uh, the idea of what is happening in the program. I don't like that verbose syntax and I don't need it for this tutorial. So we have eliminated state and uh, another benefit is that um, imagine that uh, we send many messages at once. Now since this is a pure function of x. Well, it's not really pure. It could have side effects, but it only depends on x. It does not depend on other state. We could very easily imagine that the hundred uh, chemical actors are instantiated in parallel. So um, the runtime engine uh, is free to do that. It's free to decide to run several of these computations in parallel because they are just functions of the initial of, of the input data and uh, they don't have state that we need to initialize They're all, it's all automatic now so automatic parallelism becomes natural and so that's why the chemical machine is free to run as many uh, computations in parallel as is, is possible or reasonable in other words, the programmer does not need to specify that things must run in parallel. This becomes automatic. It is safe to run them in parallel. It's also safe not to run them in parallel. So uh, if we run this code, uh, it is up to the runtime system to decide what will be run in parallel and how much in order to optimize performance. Uh, and that's that's a very good result. So the programmer is free from that consideration, or at least somewhat free. Of course, it's not ever going to be completely free of such considerations as how many threads I need and so on. But at least it becomes easier. It's um, I'm not managing these threads myself or these instances in parallel myself. Whereas in the actor model or in the ACA library. I would have to decide how many parallel instances to create. I would have to create a router uh, and so on. It's a lot of extra work on the programmer's part to do that in the actor model. 
uh, and here the parallelism is automatic. Now, um, we have lost the states. So if we compare this pseudocode with that, here we had a function of two arguments, and here we have only a function of one argument. So we have lost some expressive power. What is necessary for us to regain that power? What is necessary is that this function f must have two arguments. If we could have that, and if it somehow, somewhere would get this value s, the state, then we would have exactly the same expressive power. So it is very logical to say, well, why don't we just have several messages that are consumed at once? So, for example, two messages are consumed at once. And um, in order to understand how that works, let's change the pseudocode a little bit so that we more we specify the mailbox references more more explicitly in the code. So let's write it like this. It's still pseudocode, it's just for us to think about what should be happening. And later I will show the actual Scala syntax. Um, so we just want to say that there's a mailbox called C1 with messages of integer type and whenever that message is, is available, this needs to be run. So the message is consumed from the mailbox, the value x is extracted, and this function is evaluated with whatever side effects this function has. So now imagine we have several actors that consume messages from different mailboxes, and we can also imagine very easily that one actor consumes two messages at once from two different mailboxes. From C1 it consumes an integer value, from C2 it consumes a string value. So let's imagine that we somehow arrange that to happen so that C1 is a mailbox that has integer valued messages and C2 has string valued messages. So when uh, a message is sent to C1 and another message is sent to C2, the runtime system will automatically re recognize that and find that this chemical actor can be automatically instantiated and run. So this then re regains the expressive power that we had before. So now we have uh, a function of two variables. Um, so we could keep the state as a value on a message in a mailbox and then we would have a function of two values. So we could say this is the state and this is the message and this is a side effect that will uh, compute whatever we need as a function of x and y. If we want to update the state, all we need to do is to send another message to the mailbox with the state. So that's uh, one of the side effects we're allowed to have. The logic of execution is that chemical actors start only when a message is available in each of the mailboxes that are required. So the chemical actor specifies one or more mailboxes that it waits on and whenever a message is available, some message is available in each of them, then some message will be consumed from both of them at once and then the actor will start. And since uh, this consuming of two messages at once is done atomically, so either both are consumed or none of them are consumed, and that is necessary, you cannot just consume one 
because you have a function of two arguments and so you won't have the second value uh, if you don't consume that message. Then it is safe to have programs like this that take uh, messages from various mailboxes and they actually here there are two actors, chemical actors, that both want a message from mailbox C1 and then also from some other mailbox. And that's safe because either one will run or the other. Um, if messages are available then the runtime engine needs to make a decision as to which actor to run and once this decision is made let's say C1 and C2 uh, messages are consumed and if C1 had only one message then it will become empty after that so this is running now but um, the second one cannot run because it doesn't have a message in C1 so it's completely safe from race conditions in that sense Let's look at the Scala syntax uh, that implements these constructions. So in the Scala syntax in the chemist library, you have to create mailbox references uh, like this, specifying their types. Once you have defined the mailbox references, you can define your chemical actors using the syntax. So this is very similar to what we were writing here, except this from and so on, which was just pseudocode for clarity. This becomes this syntax, which is actual Scala syntax. Um, so the user needs to define mailbox references and chemical actor bodies that depend on values of the consumed messages and then there are some arbitrary side effects here. Um, sending a message is done in this syntax, not using, not with the exclamation mark as it is done in, in uh, the ACCA library, but with this syntax. Um, this is of course an insignificant detail uh, this difference is completely insignificant, but uh, what is significant is that um, you do not define specific instances of these actors. You only declare the computations that go in them because um, the chemical machine has a runtime engine that will automatically manage instances of all actors. What you do have to define is the mailbox references. So these are not actor references, these are mailbox references. A single actor can consume messages from one or more mailboxes at once. Now in the chemical metaphor, messages are called molecules and mailbox references are called molecule emitters because, because of this operation that where you send the message to mailbox C1 you emit a molecule C1 with value 1 to 3. That's the same, it's just different words to describe exactly the same operational semantics. Namely, a new message is put into the mailbox C1 and the message carries an integer value 123. Now, um, another feature that we can use is that these um, uh, chemical actor definitions can contain guard conditions. Now, if they can contain arbitrary guard conditions, then you can have a situation as shown in this code where the first actor will only run when this condition holds and this condition depends on the values of the messages and similarly the second uh, uh, reaction or second 
chemical actor, which is called reaction in the chemical metaphor. It runs only when this condition holds. Now, imagine that we say you have several messages in this mailbox and several messages in this mailbox and in this mailbox. Then, for some of these messages, for some combinations of them, this condition may hold, and for other combinations it may not hold. And um, if you are now restricted to consuming messages in the order they are received, then you might have a deadlock situation. Namely, a message is available such that this condition holds, but this message is not the first one in the mailbox, and uh, it's, uh, it's the second one. And so, in order to make progress, uh, the chemical machine therefore must allow mailboxes to be unordered. In uh, the actor model, mailboxes are ordered, they're just uh, queues, linear queues. In the chemical machine, mailboxes are not ordered, they are bags, multisets. So, um, now, actually, if no guard conditions are given, if all the actors are just waiting on one or more messages, then you don't need to allow them, the mailboxes, to, to give messages out of order. You, you don't need that, because you, you can always give messages in the order received. And that uh, improves performance, of course. It's much faster to just take the first message off the queue, rather than go through the entire multiset looking for messages X and going through the second mailbox multiset looking for a message with value Y, such that this condition holds. That could be a long search. Uh, however, in some cases this could be a short search, uh, and so why not have this possibility? The chemical machine uh, is able to run, uh, in any case, with unordered mailboxes, but for performance, the chemist library automatically detects uh, situations where mailboxes can be ordered, where uh, making mailboxes ordered will not change the semantics of, of the program. So there is a rigorous condition that is computed and uh, that um, is described in another chapter in the documentation book. Let us see now that chemical actors can simulate ordinary actors. So ordinary actors have these features. They can uh, update the local mutable state uh, and also perform side effects that depend on the message value. They can send messages to other actors. They can create other actors. Um, they can pass references to other actors as values. And there's another interesting functionality that an actor can change its behavior. It can create a different behavior for itself or, or become another actor, as they call it, after processing a message with a certain value. And then all further messages will be performed, will, will be consumed and, and, um, and a different designated function body uh, will be can, will, will be executed or evaluated on those messages. So um, let's see how we can simulate these features using chemical actors. So as we have seen before this pseudocode for the ordinary actor um, can be replaced by chemical actors with two mailboxes. So one mailbox will be for these messages X and the second mailbox will be for the state. This will be the code for the chemical actor, or, or reaction, as, we, as I, I call it, um, using the chemical metaphor. 
So it takes two messages, one from MX, one from MS. It evaluates exactly the same as before, the function f. It also evaluates the function new state exactly as before. But instead of assigning a mutable value, uh, it just sends a message to the mailbox ms with the new value of the state. Now, the mailbox ms had a message initially. That message carried the initial state. That message was consumed. And now we are emitting a new message in the same mailbox with a new value. And we're also consuming the message from mailbox MX. So from the point of view of the mailbox MS, there will always be at most one message in it. And this message will always carry the current value of the state. And every time this message arrives into MX, we will update that message. We will temporarily consume it and then make a new one emit a new message to the mailbox ms. This is very similar to treating state in functional programming where we don't modify, we create a new value and replace in some in some way. Not, we don't actually modify, we don't actually um, have mutable state. So in this way we have completely reproduce the entire expressive power of this ordinary actor. And of course, uh, you can send messages to any other actors. So instead of sending messages to actors, you send messages to their mailbox. So each actor has a designated mailbox for messages and another mailbox for its state. And so at the beginning of your program, you create all these mailboxes for each of the actors that you had in your actor program. And then instead of initializing uh, actors states, you send messages to the state mailboxes for each uh, actor. And then you define these chemical actors according to each actor that you define here. And you're done. So then Sending messages to actors is directly uh, simulated by sending messages to their message mailboxes. Actor's state is directly simulated by the state mailbox. Creating a new actor uh, is, is straightforward. This could be done inside this function f just as easily because creating uh, a new actor is this, is this code. It's a, it can, can be done also in a local scope of uh, an actor's body in, in here. Uh, and uh, mailbox references, these MX and MS, are values. So you can put them on values of messages, just like you do with actor references. You can send an actor reference to some other actor on a message. So here you just send mailbox references instead of actor references. And as we see, there is a designated mailbox for messages for each actor and for state for each actor. So you can just send the message mailbox reference, which is MX. And that's exactly what uh, you would need to do uh, to replace sending an actor reference. Since here we, we replace actors actor references by mailbox references. And finally, let's see how we could replace behavior uh, and become another actor. In order to do that, all we need to do is to introduce another mailbox for the state of the new actor. And uh, that new actor will have a body like this it will have the same message mailbox MX, but a different state mailbox. And in order to become that actor, all we need to do is to emit this instead of emitting this. So at the end of our computation, we emitted the 
the updated state to the state mailbox. Now we just emit it to another state mailbox. Once we do that, we will have no more messages in the old state mailbox because we consumed them. We consumed the only message that was there. We will have one message in MS2. So now this actor cannot be started anymore because it doesn't have messages in MS. Uh, when, when a message arrives to MX, only this actor can be started. And this actor could have a different body. And if this actor now emits again MS2, then it will keep uh, processing the messages that come into MX. It can also emit MS again under some conditions, and then it becomes the first actor again. So in this way, we completely simulate the features uh, of the actor model. However, of course, we have uh, much more freedom. We don't need to uh, program like this uh, with state mailboxes and um, message mailboxes. This is just a translation of an ordinary actor program into the chemical machine. In the chemical machine, it is much easier to reason directly about messages uh, in, in mailboxes rather than first design an actor program and then translate it into the chemical machine. But you can do that if that's what you need. So to summarize, um, what we have found is that um, we free ourselves from the burden of managing actor references. There's no more life cycle. There's no more uh, supervision for actors or uh, routers because parallelism is automatic. Um, there's no more uh, actor references explicitly being passed around. Um, what if the actor is not available? There's dead letter, actor, none of that. None of that is, is necessary in the chemical machine because actors are automatically handled by the runtime system. And the consequences of this are that um, the runtime system is able to optimize performance uh, more, of, more or less automatically. Uh, the runtime system can do things in parallel, which is completely safe because uh, the data is consumed atomically. So the programmer doesn't need to worry about um, uh, mutable state. There is no mutable state. Uh, chemical machine programming, as we have just seen, is much closer to functional programming than actor model because it does not have updates, does not have mutation. Instead of mutation, you can just emit messages with new values. So all data lives on messages. There is no data that is stored in some mutable state. The lack of actor instances also eliminates a class of errors where you are using incorrect actor reference um, such as what you can get with ACA, where um, you use the sender reference, but uh, it becomes incorrect because these are all imperative and mutable interfaces that are hard to use without errors. None of that uh, is even possible to express in the chemical machine because there is no reference to an actor, uh, there is no reference to state, there is just mailboxes. Mailbox references are immutable because they don't do anything, they just provide you a way of sen sending messages into mailboxes. Messages are themselves immutable. Certainly you can cheat with Scala, you can put vars everywhere, 
but you don't have to, and you shouldn't, unless there's a very good reason. Um, so, as a result, programming becomes much closer to functional programming. Um, it, it still have side effects. Of course, emitting a message is a side effect uh, because it runs processes. And even if these processes contain nothing but pure functions that emit other messages, it is still a side effect. Um, however, this is the only implicit side effect that you have in your code. Your code does not explicitly manage threads, processes, instances of processes, and you don't reason about things that run. You reason about data, immutable data that is present or not present. So your reasoning to understand how some program works is mostly about which messages are present, and if they're present, then what needs to be done with the values on them. That is a much easier uh, kind of reasoning, which is much less error prone than the reasoning about which processes are running with what state at any given time. So, um, in the chemical metaphor, instead of chemical actors, we say reactions, instead of messages, we say molecules, and instead of mailbox references, we say molecule emitters. Um, but these are just words that describe operational semantics, perhaps in a more visual manner, but doesn't change what it actually is, which, which is described just as well using um, this modified actor model that I explained in this tutorial. So I encourage you to uh, take a look at examples in the chemist project and um, try to see how you can reason about uh, the data rather than about processes. This concludes the tutorial.